day though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because the, the land I was living in, it was called Death Valley. So the, I did not want to become a characteristic of the place. I wanted to illustrate that it is not where you are from that makes you who you are. It is who you are and who you aspire to be. Hey everyone, this week on The Trailblazers, we have well-known economist, senior university lecturer, and a former senator, Dr. Andre Houghton, who will be sharing his incredible journey. He rose from living in the inner city community of Mount Salem to getting his PhD in his 20s. And he will be sharing with us his journey to success, the strategies and the path that he took, and what we can do likewise to rise above our circumstances no matter where we are coming from. You want to stay tuned for this episode. It is a must watch. This episode of The Trailblazers is sponsored by my PR company, Yes Stars Publicity. Send us an email to starspublicity at gmail.com for all your public relation and publicity needs. We take clients from right across the world. Our other sponsors are Care is Beauty. Their information is listed in the description box. Contact them for all your skincare and beauty needs. Also DG's Health and Wellness Center. If you want to lose weight or just get in shape, then they are the one that you need to contact. Their information is also listed in the description box. And if you're looking at that beautiful painting right behind me, if you want to get a similar piece or something even better, custom made paintings and designs. Their information is also listed in the description box. What's your word to them? I would say to fight. Fight for your dreams, fight for your purpose. The life that inspires you, that motor that you aspire to be. Right. Uh, in my humble opinion is become very comfortable with yourself. Very important. You know, the saying in Jamaica, one hand can't clap. You forgive yourself for allowing people to mistreat you. Disciplines that we need to embody. You just have to work at it and be committed to everyone. And it's scary to have all of that fall away from you. And you have to celebrate those wins. Work with right. fitness clients. For guidance, rely on Christ for support. And no rush. I did it. I, I made my move into entrepreneurship at 40. Um, so chicken, so scared. That when what, you know, last comments would you want to share with you? You have your core values. You do the right things. It'll fall in place for you. Dr. Andre Houghton is an economist and a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics at the University of the West Indies, Mona. He earned his PhD from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. He is a KPMG Pete Marwick, Thomas De La Rue, and a British Commonwealth scholar. He is also an International Monetary Fund IMF Distinguished Academic Fellow and much more. Despite growing up in the inner city community of Mount Salem, he has managed to beat the odds. This trailblazer tells us more in this episode. Hi, Dr. Hahn. It is a pleasure to have you joining us on the Trailblazers, and it's great to have you. Hi, Tamara. How are you today? I am great. I am great. And you just highlighted we were having a little bit of banter before we actually started, and I can't believe, like, I interviewed you 10 years ago when I was a student. I'm like, wow, that was the first time I interviewed you. I can you imagine time flies? This media thing has really matured on you and you have grown, you know, so keep up the great work. Thank you. And likewise, you are doing amazing things yourself. I mean, you were doing amazing things then and you're getting even bigger and better. So congrats on all the successes to date. So jumping into the interview because the Trailblazers, as I'd mentioned, is featuring inspirational personalities and persons with a story, persons who have overcome various odds, and you fit that description to a T, right? And just because I know a bit of your background, I want you to share with your viewers because I'm not sure how many people know that you grew up, you know, in the ghetto, what we what we in Jamaica call Come it. On. I'm, I'm from Mount Salem, and I've never hidden that. I walk with it on my forehead. Basically because what we realize is that there is not much expectation of young people coming out of inner city area. 
not 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 much positive expectations. Uh, Mount Salem growing up, it was a, a very good community, though volatile. It afforded us the ability to engage in, 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 in human interaction, which is necessary for socialization. We played a lot of sports. So it's, a, it's basically a sporting community. So we played a lot of football. The young women played a lot of netball. Uh, in, in Montego Bay, at the time, there wasn't much emphasis on athletics, especially going to Cornwall College. We, 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 football was our staple. Uh, it was way after when Usain Bolt became so prominent and Asaf Powell became so prominent that high schools started really investing in this track and field thing. So most of the young boys, when I was growing up, wanted to be footballers. I, I was in high school in 98. I graduated the same time in Jamaica, went to World Cup. So you must can understand the euphoria that surrounded us as young boys at the time, you, the country making it to the FIFA World Cup for the first time. Now, with this said, many of us wanted to pursue careers as footballers, but looking at the prospect of becoming an international player, then the, 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 the opportunity wasn't that great. So you're looking at a country of 200,000 boys, only 10 of them make it. If you fall in the top 50, you won't make it, so you have to choose another option. Which my mother was very keen on academics, so she instilled in me, you know, certain principles that today, labor for learning before you grow old, because learning is better than silver and gold. Silver and gold will vanish away, but a good education will never decay. So those principles guided me up to completing my high school years, you know. I always said, when I was doing CXC and I was leaving home in the mornings and even though I studied and even though I prepared, I will always say the 23rd Psalms as soon as I exit my house, you know? So I always repeated the 20, 23rd Psalm, Lord, is, you know what I mean? My shepherd, I shall not want. And I just kept repeating it every morning before exam. I can do, yeah, do, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because the, the land I was living in, it was called Death Valley. So it was called Death Valley because a lot of the people there, to some extent, were troubled. And when we played football, our team was the most aggressive. So the men from Death Valley, you know, so that name stuck with them. And I did not want to become a characteristic of the place. I wanted to illustrate that it is not where you are from that makes you who you are. It is who you are and who you aspire to be. So, And stick a point there because that is so vital that you just mentioned that. That literally when you were saying the 23rd Psalm, you were actually walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Because there you were, you said the lane was called Death Valley. And yeah, put things into perspective, many Jamaicans know that. Even right now, there is a zone of special operation in Mount Salem, and it is still considered a, a volatile area. So mm -hmm. for you, how was it that? Because you went to Cornwall College, right? Yes, I did. So even that, in and of itself, was an accomplishment, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was the only boy from my lane who went to Cornwall College, but my uncle did it before me. He went to Cornwall. So it's not as if going to Cornwall College was what they call it alien to my family because I had an aunt who also went to Mobe High and she was an accountant. So I, I saw what they did and then said, okay, if they are human beings and they were able to go to Cornwall and then elevate themselves then i am also a human being so i am also going to take this step i live beside a sound man Sylvan, and he would play music every night because he have a bar and sometimes you know you go home you want to study you want peace and quiet but it's just not there because you're hearing the music you're hearing cussing somewhere down the line you're hearing gunshots up the road and so on and so forth. But this gave you now a choice. Are you going to succumb to 
the circumstances that are presented to you or are you going to elevate above and beyond? So it all boils up to your concentration level. So I always said to myself, in order for you to make it in this life, then it's like you have to be able to study inside of a speaker box. So that was the sort of metaphor that I use to motivate myself to be resilient. Because if you can, if you have ever sat in a speaker box while it played, it's really thumping, oh. thumping, thumping, thumping. So I always said to and, and train myself to make the best of the most adverse situations, you know, because that is what life is about. Life is about overcoming challenges. Life is about where you are, who you are at the time and the position does not have to define basically who you become if you train yourself to overcome challenges definitely i definitely agree with that andre what kind of mindset did you have to have because unfortunately this is the reality of so many other young men who are living in the ghetto in volatile communities and you know, as we see with the crime and violence, unfortunately, a lot of them follow gangs and take a different route. So what sort of mindset did you have at such an early age that, you know, make it so that you are going to do well and make it out? And I'm, 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 I'm an econometrician. So what I do, I teach my students how to forecast, how to use information from the past to make predictions about the future. So when I looked around me and I saw the persons who were involved in gang violence and the outcome, I mean, some of them were able to become very wealthy and have all that they want. But the type of lifestyle and how they got it was not necessarily how I wanted to go about it. Because in that situation, it would be easy to follow that part. You're following because that part is what presents itself to you. You know, you have to find the courage now to seek your own path because that is what life is about. Life is not about following X or following Y. Life is about seeking out your own path and finding the trailblazers who have traveled that path before you and emulate them. So it's, it's like you turn on the TV and you see a gun show up here. You know, as you watch it, you can change the channel. The following, so I'm change the channel, gonna discover man, I'm gonna history channel. You following, and that is what changes your perspective on life and what you want from life. You following, so I did history in high school because I was always concerned about why some people are rich and why some people are poor. So I'm growing up in a board house where you still have your amenities. Your mother still providing for you. You're still comfortable because I didn't grow suffering. You follow me? You grow comfortable even though you're growing at the garrison. You still grow comfortable. So we you still know that some people richer than you. They have 10 houses. They have 10 villa, 15 car. They own plane. They own helicopter. They own big business. When did this all start? Remember growing up in the garrison, you don't have a clue, you know, you're just born in the circumstance. So, you know, really study to get an understanding of why some people accumulate more, why some people accumulate less. So, this economics now was important because it teaches you how to use your scarce resources to get the most efficiency and the most output. So, it was always about Okay, why are we here? We were slaves. And it's a real thing. It's a true thing. We were slaves when we had to work all day without pay in the sun. Now you tell somebody say, to walk from here, so go down there, so go to something for them own good. They might tell us the sun too hot. Boy, I can't go because the sun too hot. 
we have to wait till later and simple tasks become problem to people, which I am saying to myself, a hundred years ago, we had no choice. We have to do it. Yes. No, we have a choice. We're not doing it. So it's like, because we get the choice, we're not exercising our right to become someone upstanding. Mm -hmm. You following? And it was that right that I knew I had and I had to exercise it over time, which is why I embarked on this mission to use knowledge as a tool to unlock not only my, my, my understanding of the world, but also the people around me, my students, and, and, and the people who I grew up with and so on and so forth. Certainly. And fast forward after Cornwall um, in your journey, then you went to the University of the West Indies. And, you know, even later on, I'm, I'm going to let you share with us, but even later on, you ended up getting a big scholarship and studying abroad. So tell me about that. Yeah, man. I, when I went to Uwe, my my mother and my grandmother, uh, they paid the first year school fee. But that, that was all they had. That was all their resources, you know? So I met a mentor who said to me that if I studied hard, as well as get involved in student politics and play sports and other co-curricular activities, then that might increase the chance of me getting a scholarship. And I said, what? He said, if you study hard, get good grades, then I get a scholarship. So I'm like, what does a scholarship cover? He said, everything. So I said, what do you mean? So I come here to pay for study. But if I study hard, they pay me to study? The man said, yes. <laughs> that was a win-win scenario. Yes. Win-win scenario. So instead of going to find a work now to help to pay to study, I just made studying my work. So wow. straight through concentration, straight through. And I didn't do it as a nerd. I did it as a balanced student. I still played sports. I still, at one time, I was a CAC for Taylor Hall, where I was responsible for hosting all the parties. You know, at one time, I was black representative for, for, for a block on Taylor Hall as well. So I played an integral role. I also did Talawa with drama oh, yeah. and, and so on. So, so, and we won. So it's not as if we did it at a substandard level. Yeah. We had a play that w was built on how different people caught AIDS, we called it the silent killer. And we did it without speaking a word. And, and the play was so creative. Big up Tanisha McGee. She was the one who produced the play at that time. You know, so at the end of my first year, I did 12 courses. I think I got 11 A's and a B plus. Oh, wow. And I, that plus the co-curricular activities. So when I went to the scholarship interview, it was just up to how I articulated myself, which I did, and they appreciated what I brought to the fore, and I got the scholarship. After completing my bachelor's degree, I graduated top of my class, first class honors in Canon accounts, and then I got another scholarship from Thomas Delarue to do a master's degree in economics, which I did very well as well. And then I got a, another scholarship to go to the UK to do a PhD in economics at the University of Essex. I stayed there for four years, call it three and a half, four years, and completed as well. And then I came back. I thought that was the time you interviewed me when you were with the, the Owen James report when, when, when I just got back. But yes. this is the point. We lack financial literacy. We lack an understanding of economics. We lack the idea of what we can be if we use our brains positively. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm zooming in back in terms of your story now. So as a noted economist, you know, you are somebody that is definitely called upon in many occasions, especially now we're dealing with the impacts of COVID and moving forward. But what led you down that path? Was that, for example, something that you always wanted to do or it just sort of happened? You know, first, when I started learning about disciplines and learning about careers, I wanted to become an accountant because it was the easiest thing to me. Like doing accounts in high school, I got the highest grade every time, even without trying. 
You follow me? Because that simple thing, check and balance X and Y, apply the principles and then voila, it work. All you have to do is have to have a keen eye. But I started to realize that doing accounts, I would find myself working in a firm, trying to be an auditor or an accountant every day, which I'm a people person. And I'm curious about how people move up the ladder. I'm curious about how economies work, how people move from the process of being poor to rich, or how people move from being rich to wealthy. And not just people, economic agents, businesses, countries. Because whilst growing up, I realized that a lot of people looked up to Jamaica for more ways than one. The entire African nation see Jamaica as their Mecca. Jamaica, Jamaica is like Mecca. So it's like we are gods. You know, we are remarkable beyond belief. So we have to know, structure ourselves in a particular manner where we can benefit from how wealthy we are because we just don't understand the economics and the coordination. So I saw economics, therefore, as a useful tool to assist us, not just myself, but all economic agents beginning from Jamaica and the Caribbean, to become who we are supposed to be. So I didn't want our history or our little short spread as slaves to define who we'll be in the future. So one of the things you just mentioned in terms of the ladder of success, right? And for somebody like yourself who literally started at the bottom in a sense, mm -hmm. and um, you're doing well, you've also been in politics as a senator and so many other things that you're doing. So what would you share with other persons, not only young, but especially our young men as well, um, in terms of what are the steps that they can take to, you know, to rise up that ladder of success. And bearing in mind that not everybody may be a bright educational spark. Like no, hard work is the keys to success. No matter what you do, there's a book called Outlier that says you have to put in the 10,000 hours. I believe. Oh my gosh. Oh, I, just, I literally have the book. Yeah, man. I think he's a Jamaican writer. Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell. I was yeah. swear because I literally have it right here beside yeah, me. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's about the time and the patience that you have. People should be long term in their thinking. People can't be just thinking for today or thinking for. Just know you have to be long term, and if you're a long term, it means that you understand that your life on average is going to be 70 to 80 years. So, 70 to 80 years, you need a foundation, so you have to spend at least 30 years preparing to live the next 50 years. If you spend only 10 years preparing, it means, therefore, that the foundation that you have at that particular time is not as strong and robust enough. So how you get that foundation is about learning. So putting yourself in a channel to learn. Be your wants. Too much young people want to grow up too quick. They want to become mommy and daddy. They want to work because they want money. When you get to work with $10,000 when you're 18, if you take the time out, work, study hard, and you can get to work to $10 million by the time you're 28. You understand? So the point is preparation. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. And that is one of the mantras I live by, five Ps. Proper preparation prevent poor performance. And I always make sure that I'm prepared. So I use my time wisely. Even if I don't have something pending, I'm preparing even before the time arises. So when the time arises, I'm comfortable because I, I prepared for this two years ago. So it's as if it's in my DNA. So I'm spitting it like fire. You following? So the idea is that we have to understand that music and sports alone cannot structure an efficient economy. Mm -hmm. We need people who are studied people in discipline who understand how processes function. Mm -hmm. The following, mm -hmm. we need people who understand how to coordinate industries and how to move industries along a wealth playing field, not just providing jobs, because that is, that is what Jamaica has been doing since slavery. 
All we have been doing is providing jobs, job creation. Everybody is working. But if you're working and the value of what you are creating is not increasing, it means that we're underemploying our people. And that is what we want to reduce. We want to minimize the exploitation of our people because we want to give them wealth so that they can see themselves for who they are and to be who they are in the world. Okay, so we are winding down. On a lighter note, I know we're you know, in the midst of the pandemic, but what's a typical day in your life like? <laughs> My typical day. So I wake up like at 6 in the morning and then I'll do some reading so I don't waste that time. So I read until about eight or whatever I have to do. Then we take a you know, break, you know, do my local workout between so eight thirty and nine. You know, I go go sometimes so between eight fifteen and nine fifteen, and then I'm ready to start the day at that time. So it depends if I have meetings or if I have business to do or whatever the case to be. Remember, we operate Scarce Commodity Plan Consulting as well. So we do a lot of work in the cannabis industry and so on and so forth. We also have made a financing that we try to use to help young people. It's a, these are charity organizations, Mayday Financing and Valley Foundation, that we use to help people with their financial literacy and budgeting. Mm -hmm. So I try as best as possible, you know. So the idea is to so throw up my day you now after I'm completing the meeting and so on. I'm just writing. So I write, write for the entire day until probably, say, 12 in the evening. Sometimes I have functions at 7, so I have to go and, and, and functions at 7. I would normally play football on Saturday and Sunday mornings, Tuesday evenings, but since the pandemic, we, we kind of have, we are restricted. So the schedule and so on, you know, it's not as how it used to be. But, but, but the, the point is, you you live a very rounded and balanced life, and you mentioned in terms of your other businesses and the cannabis, and um, also the other business that you are part of. One of the things that I like about you, though, is that so many people achieve success and they don't go back or they don't give back. What and you are somebody who gives back frequently to your community. So why is that so crucial for you to you know to serve and to pay it forward? I mean, you have, a, you have a mango tree, you have a lime tree, you have an apple tree. You see, in, in, in inner city areas, if you have a nice jewelry mango tree, everybody read the tree, so the tree dead. So it's just like being lime tree left or Bitters where nobody no want. You following? So you have to now be that tree. Show them a different part. You can't just have example of violence, an example of danmanship, an example of negativity. You have to have an example of, of positivity too. So I make it my duty because God has bestowed upon me the ability to be positive then I have to show them that being positive can also reap benefits. And I have to be up in them face with it. So it's like, how do you then convince a nation of people to be greater than they think they are? Because that is the problem, you know. We don't believe in ourselves intrinsically that we are greater than who we are. We know that's why I see some of them want to be greater, but they don't believe, so they don't exercise the ability to really become that person. You following? So positive, negative examples are great. So positive examples like ourselves, we have to make ourselves present as well. Certainly. And I love that point that you mentioned and that applies to just about any people, any race, any nationality, any person. Because the fact is, if you don't believe that you are, you know, greater than yourself, or if you don't believe in yourself, then nothing is going to be possible. But the moment your, mind, your mindset change and your mindset shifts, you find that your, your world and your life begins to change in a positive direction. So 
I certainly appreciate that point. My last question to you, you, are, you have been blazing the trail and you continue to blaze the trail and no doubt your future continues to be even brighter and brighter. And I just want you to share with our aspiring trailblazers and all our viewers, you know, some rules and some steps that they can begin to take right now what, the moment they watch this interview, they can begin to implement, to just start to transform their life. So I had to use the philosophy, let every adversity give rise to an opportunity for greatness. Because what happens is that many people, the moment they encounter an adversity in any way, shape or form, whether it want to be a huge adversity, or it wants to be a very small adversity, when they encounter adversity, they quail and give up. You following? But the adversity is the challenge because that is life. And the bigger the challenge, the bigger the triumph after you have overcome that particular challenge. So it's about developing a feeling of overcoming and it's about getting satisfaction from overcoming challenges. So we have to challenge ourselves as young people. We have to challenge ourselves as leaders. We have to challenge ourselves as men and women to overcome any adversity that might arise in our life. And that means that we develop the level of concentration and the level of intrinsic got motivation to help us over those hurdles. Starting now, look at your life like a 400 meter hurdle race with different hurdles over time. Don't try to jump the last hurdle before you have completed the first hurdle. Focus on each hurdle as it presents itself to you, but bear the long-term hurdle race in mind. And this is how I approach life. So I take my short-term steps lead me straight to my long-term objective. And don't be afraid if you get sidetracked because we all do. As, 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 as successful as people think I am, I do sometimes sidestep. But the key is to remember who you are and what your purpose is. Wow, you are <laughs> such an amazing guest. <laughs> and thank you so much, you know, Dr. Hart and Andre for just sharing on the platform, sharing on the program, and just continue to inspire to, you know, be a role model and to blaze your trail. Oh, thank you so much. And keep up the great work as well. I've watched you grow in this media business uh, over the last 10 years, and I'm very proud of the woman that you have become. And I'm even more proud of the woman that you are going to be. Great Thank work. you so much. Hey everyone, I am Tamar McHale, television presenter, communication specialist, and of course, producer and host of The Trailblazers. I'm inviting you to join the family. All you have to do is just hit that subscribe button. Yes, just click it. Click the notification bell as well so you'll be alerted whenever we post an episode. And just join the family for weekly inspirational, motivational, and edifying episodes that not only will lift your spirits, but will give you some practical tools that you can elevate yourself and blaze your trail.